eh, cómo puede existir el cine contemporáneo en México y creo que una fervientemente creemos que la única salvación que tenemos como sociedad contemporánea y en este caso en el cine contemporáneo es que todo lo podamos ver de forma horizontal entonces de ahí surgió la idea eh, bueno horizontal lo vemos como que todas las personas estamos al mismo nivel eh, y no hay jerarquías eh, más bien roles y parte de la industria cinematográfica a veces se, se rige mucho por jerarquías y deja mucho fuera a todas las voces que conforman una película entonces este fue la idea de, de, de ahí surgió la idea de crear un diálogo entre diseñadores gráficos que siempre están en la industria y son parte esencial de, de pues del ciclo de, y y pues ya se me fue el avión, pero pues básicamente es eso, o sea, como acercar, eh, tratar de ampliar la industria a, a nuevas miradas y que y crear un diálogo también a través de, de eh, del espectador, que en este caso fueron ilustradores y esperemos que no siempre sean ilustradores, sino más bien público en general, pero tratar de ampliar el diálogo a que lleguen más personas y que el cine contemporáneo no se quede siempre entre los mismos. Y pues eso, de ahí salió la idea y pues… La muestra está justo afuera, eh, son 11 carteles por 11 ilustradoras. Eh, creo que de, conscientemente elegimos mujeres ilustradoras porque no siempre se le da voz a la mujer en, y menos, como podemos ver aquí, somos mayoría en, en espectadoras, pero no siempre mayoría en el otro lado. Entonces, esa es la idea. Muchas gracias. Just for our guests, she said that the intention was to create a dialogue to deconstruct the pyramidal structure of cinema, and I hope you enjoyed the dialogue we have with the posters outside. I think this one is from... Sorry, of course it was yours. No, 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 it's... My stand-up, it's over, so I left you with the great Jordan Cronk. Thank you for coming, and I remind you that this is live streaming, global, on our social media, so be careful with what you said. <laughs> Good to know. Um, <laughs> thank you, Pedro. Um, thank you guys for coming. As you can see, we have a rather large panel. Um, and making things more interesting is that the films are all very, very different uh, in many different sections of the festival. Um, so I'm going to try to get to everybody and also open it up to you guys eventually to ask questions. Um, but this is convenient that we have these three people sitting here since my first question is uh, pertaining a little bit to documentary. Um, one of the through lines between some of the films here, I think, is like an engagement with nonfiction elements uh, and how that corresponds with, I don't know, traditional narrative, I guess. Um, and you can see that, I think, in MS Slavic 7 and Seven Years in May quite a bit, and then, uh, or Seven Years of May. Uh, and then also in Behind the Shutters, uh, which is probably the most uh, recognizably nonfiction film amongst the films here. Uh, so to start, maybe each of you can maybe talk a little bit about uh, how your work relates to nonfiction. Obviously, Afonso, you draw on uh, history, political history, uh, and things in your, in your films, um, whereas Sophia draws on personal history, family history, and things like that. And then Behind the Shutters, of course, is also a very personal film as well. So uh, I was just curious what your relationship is with nonfiction and how you see your work relating to, to documentary in general. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great question. We were talking a lot about um, docufiction on our way over here. Um, and I guess like working in hybridity. So with me, um, my film started with exploring my family's history. Um, so the first film that I made was about my grandmother who was in her 80s trying to contact a, last, a lost love um, that she knew when she was in her 20s. And it was a story that happened between the two of us that I wanted to tell, I guess, on screen, but it was too awkward for me to be in a film and I didn't want to make a documentary and I also didn't want to act in my own film either. So um, I started working with an actor named Derek Campbell who I co-directed Emma Slavic 7 with 
later on in Never Eat Alone, and she acted as like, I guess, like a version of myself, a, like a different family member, um, and we kind of created this character named Audrey Benack, who wears my grandfather's clothing sometimes, um, lived in like my cousin Grace's apartment, and is kind of different pieces of different family members, pieces of myself, also pieces of Dara, but interacts with my family. So in MS Slavic 7, um, we're exploring letters that belong to my great-grandmother that I found in an archive in Harvard, and it's about discovering those letters and, I guess, um, studying their contents. So what we did with that film is Dara actually came to my great-aunt and uncle's 60th wedding anniversary, and it was an experiment just to kind of see how that would go, and we had a, a structure for the narrative um, but what we did at that party was we sat her down at the head table um, and I had her interact with different family members and I wasn't really sure how we were going to use that footage, but it ended up being something that we structured within the film, uh, within these narrative points of her going to the library looking at these letters, but also kind of incorporating this footage of her interacting um, with my family. Um, so that's kind of like where I, I started sometimes. Um, there are pieces, I guess, of my own story and history that go into the film that um, dare I guess like reenacts, but also there's that real life element as well. Messi, maybe you can talk about, uh, you also work with archival materials in your film, so semi uh, correspondence with uh, Sophia's film. So about the letters that are in the film and the materials you're drawing on? And also maybe just describe the film a little bit for people who might not have seen it yet. <laughs> okay. Uh, how it works? It works? Exactly. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, for me, um, it's uh, an important question to, to ask about the fiction and documentary, but f for me, it's uh, um, when you film uh, an image or an archive, it, it becomes also fiction, and that's what I try to to make it in the movie. It's always to put uh, subjectivity and uh, to to remind that the the image is in an image and it's not uh, reality. So the, the question about documentary as fiction is uh, for me is both mixed and uh, yeah. So. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if I should tell. Is well, it? your film it deals with uh, a factory that your family owned, and kind of uh, you tell the story of how you go to live with your uh, great grandmother, correct, across yeah. from the factory, and then you're kind of integrating all these materials that you're finding, and also telling the history of this factory and how it relates to you as you were pregnant, correct? Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's uh, for me, it's like. Um, sorry. I I can't explain it in English. It's a traveling uh, d in, a, in a small place, and I ex experiment, and I take everything I could to, uh, to experiment these materials in a very little place. Um, and Alfonso, you also, it's very, I feel like your films also has personal elements to it. Can you tell the audience a little bit about where the story came from with the, uh, this kind of a, beating this character is taken by the police and how you're having, I'm not actually sure if it's an actor or the actual person uh, reenacting this kind of a situation that happened and then him telling the story and how that relates to the real life situation. And good morning, does it work? Uh, well, uh, actually the film will be screened for the first time today oh. and so <laughs> I don't know if any anyone here could see the film so, Yes, just to complete for you to have some kind of a big picture of the film, it's a film based on a story of a friend of mine who once was beaten by the police by a mistake. He was mistaken as a drug dealer and the police, as the police in Brazil, maybe in Latin American countries or not, it's only here in third world countries are so violent and they tortured him for an entire life and this night changing his life forever. And the film is based on to try to to rebuild the memories of this night and try to deal with the, the personal memories and the ling and cinematic language on experiment different ways to try to portray a very traumatic 
uh, e event on this character's life. So it's totally based on a real event. It's totally based on their on his personal memories, but at the same time, for me, it's a matter to make a conjunction between the personal memories and the language and the construction that cinema could bring. Because for me, especially because of my political intent, it was a way to portray an, an individual in a particular life as a collective matter. It, for me, only cinema can do this, can build this bridge to, uh, to this event because for me it's important to understand in Brazil that it's not a only event that's not that hasn't happened only to to him. It's happened all the time. It's a collective issue in Brazil. And so for me, the cinema it's a way to build and to portray this correctly. And you were right. I think that it's on my previous films. I also deal with this kind of mixing point between fiction and documentary. And uh, I think that I don't have a very good explanation for this. I think that it's only, I was pushed to it because of my preference, because the film that I like and my feeling to, in dealing with the, the subject of my films. But doing my films, I, I, I was understanding that uh, for me, it, uh, to deal with the reality, to deal with the documentary, it was a way to, to push the cinema uh, to other places, to other, uh, to other faces and to other constructions that are uh, different than the commercial and the industrial one. I think that uh, for me the documentary influence in my films has come some kind of a two faces. It's a matter of approach of the subject, an approach to the bodies and to the places. It's an ethic way to deal with them. But at the same time, for me, it's a matter of method. And I think, and I'm truly convinced right now that to the independent cinema, to be really independent, it's a matter of to find different ways of making films. And for me, I think that this different way it's related to documentary because the fiction, the feature fictions, the big films and the big uh, way to making films, how industry works, I think they, it's, this leave the things a little bit more square and the way of making documentaries can contaminate our creation as a filmmakers and can bring other elements and for me to be independent, it's a matter of this as well. And the other part, like this uh, approach to the people and places that, that which we record in our films, I think it's a matter to, um, to find different ways of creating fiction. For me, the fiction, it's the final point. It's always the final point. But I can, we can start, we can begin from, from documentary. And for me, in, especially in our contemporary world, where we can see the importance and the almost overdose of image, self-creation, and of the image all the time. For me, the cinema, it's a matter to understand how can we bring some truth to the image again, you know? Because the fiction, especially the classic Hollywood and fiction, can fill us some truth about the world in the films that we haven't seen. The Fritz Langs and John Ford's film, they can show us some things very, some truths about the 20th century. And now the fiction is on, it's on a different level. And for me, it's a matter to try to find another truth to this image. And this truth can, it's a matter of construction, uh, of course, but it's a construction that is based on the reality for us to understand how can we bring different energies and different uh, truths, truths for the image, you know, and for me it's a matter to, to for me is this, this is the way of to mixing fiction and documentary, it's a matter, of, it's a gesture of to understand how can we create different kind of films, making them in different ways, and how can we make our image to be like a sign of a of the world that we are living in, not only publicity and not only commerce.
Um, Henning, your film, Young, which has screened yesterday, and uh, I believe screens again soon. Um, sorry. Uh, I was saying your film has screened already, uh, and will screen again soon, so you should see it, called Young. Um, I'm also I'm curious about how your film might relate even tangentially to uh, nonfiction. You have these scenes of the of the women speaking to the camera in these kind of like documentary type setups, um, and you're also drawing on contemporary youth culture. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you uh, I don't know uh, researched this or uh, learned about these? Uh, various situations with these women and then also how you chose to portray the kind of uh, or structure the film as like a series of uh, narrative elements interspersed with uh, talking heads like documentary sections. I, I mean I didn't plan that uh, to put it in the movie it was just uh, it just feel natural uh, in the moment to let the the girls talk to the audience about what they feel and think to mix the scenes which are staged with uh, the life or a lot of i mean a, a little bit intense life maybe for some people never saw something like this with situations also some sometimes dangerous and you don't know I think that my idea was, or the idea was um, that when you see it and we, we leave the headshots in, you don't maybe know what I just saw. Was it now real or uh, I'm confused. So to, to just keep it interesting, uh, the, it's not a classical narrative. So yeah, for me it felt uh, natural to put them put them in and let them think and let them talk about each other or about what they feel. Um, and uh, How does it relate to your life? Maybe the, you live in Berlin, I'm assuming, and you are witnessing this kind of a youth generation and these activities these girls are involved in, which range from, you know, casual drugs to kind of selling themselves, their bodies in various ways. Um, can you maybe just talk about how that, uh, how you were kind of relate to this stuff and how you came across certain uh, of these activities you see in the film? I, I, I mean, I, I think everybody knows people who has, have problems with maybe addiction or drugs or I don't know, or you even like, it's not only a movie for, about, for, about young people, for young people, is. Uh, especially a, a portrait of a generation today and I think uh, you can find this um, these kids everywhere in the world in every capital you find them here in Mexico you find them in Barcelona London New York. I don't know it's a it's a it's a culture thing to 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 rave and go to parties and um, free and the, the with with this I, for me it was just feeling natural to put my my experience from my life in a movie because I can only make a movie about something I know, a world I know, and not, uh, for me it's not interesting to write um, a story completely out of the blue, more, more showing what's going on and uh, make people forget about themselves while they watch a movie, I think is uh, why I wanted to make this movie, so you have 90 minutes free time of your own madness and your depressions and all your shit in your life. And then um, after the movie you maybe have some kind of feeling which will stay and, uh, and then, uh, yeah, it was, was success to, to watch the film. For the audience, I make it for the audience, right? Sure. Um, I think maybe some of the younger people here might be curious how some of you came to filmmaking. I know some of you actually didn't start in film. Uh, Messi, and I know you started in philosophy and literature, uh, Marius, with uh, photography, if I'm not mistaken. Or you work as a photographer as well. Um, and Henning, you're, you're an actor as well. Um, and then the others, maybe you guys also came to film and maybe through a different practice of some sort. Um, I'm curious if any one of you want to talk about how you kind of transitioned to directing films, if you started in a different medium or practice before, and maybe how that relates to what you're doing now. 
Mary, so do you, you do do photography as well. Okay. Oh, either one. It doesn't matter. No, sorry, Duh, whoever. Uh, yeah. Anyone. Anyone, okay. You, okay, let's start with you, Messine. You, st you, you study literature and, and philosophy, correct? Yeah. How did you come to filmmaking then? Uh, uh, sorry, how, what? <laughs> you, <laughs> I am yeah, lost in translation. Yeah. Um, I, I, so yeah, I studied philosophy, and uh, um, so uh, I, uh, I uh, experimented uh, images because I was in art school, and cinema uh, as a language uh, was for me the, the the only solution to to be able to put together uh, um, <laughs> the thought mm -hmm. and. Uh, and uh, the vision and the image. And I discovered the sound, so it was, yeah, completely, yeah, for me, um, it's, the cinema is uh, the best way to, to, to make uh, the discovery of mental uh, connections, and it's amazing. And Henning, you, can you talk about how you transitioned from acting to making your, this is your, one of your first films, correct? That as a director? Yeah. Yeah, oh. it's, it's the first. I <laughs> know oh, I was talking to Henning, but you can continue, yeah. Oh, no, this no, is no. your first film, though. <laughs> yes. It's so funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I was in front of the camera, but I never thought I'm an actor or something. Like, since the first day I worked with this uh, director, Klaus Lemke, it's an, an like, experienced filmmaker from Germany. Um, I was 17, so I play myself in front of the camera pretty much all these like, 10 movies we shot together. It's always uh, more... Uh, not, it was not about being an actor or something, it was about having the need to make a movie all, all the time. Because being, making a movie once and you like it and you go through it, you miss it after you finish the movie and you need to make a new movie. So it's only about the next movie and this... Uh, this changed now from me being like his assistant and maybe his character in front of the camera to, okay, dude, uh, I need to make my own stuff and tell my own stories. And that's how I don't, would, I don't want to say I'm, the, I'm a director or something. I, don't, I just like to make a movie. Right. Um, and Marius, can you talk about your maybe two practices? And if they relate at all? Um, you mean photography and... Well, a acting was more or less an accident. I mean, I had a friend who wanted to make a film. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't say hello. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I had this friend who wanted to make a film and she had no budget. So she wanted to make a film that was uh, personal and in the same time easy to make. So she asked all her friends close friends to be in that film and I was supposed in the beginning uh, in the beginning to play a small part and then the part just got bigger and bigger and uh, yeah it was it it for me it had a I mean this is personal it might not be relevant in any way but it had a therapeutic uh, effect because uh, we were shooting at nighttime and in the daytime I was staying in the hospital with my grandfather so it was actually very helpful mind-wise because it was helping me escape from, from that. And uh, going back to photography and telling s stories through image, basically, is like I think everything is linked. I mean, being a director and being a photographer and wanting to tell stories is, for me, more or less the same, the same thing. And, what the breakthrough for me actually came when I was at the DNFTS, the National Film and Television School in the UK, because there they were doing something which seems basic in a way and in the same time was very useful. At each decision that we were making, they were asking why. Why do you want to tell this story? Why do you want to tell it in such a way? Why do you choose this actor? Why do you choose this setting? And um, I, th I think this, this should be the most important thing, actually, for us as filmmakers, to ask ourselves why we want to tell a story and why we want to do it the way we do it. And if we have the answers to these questions, I think it's, it gets easier and it gets more relevant both for us and the audience. Right. 
Um, the films amongst you also range in, I think, obviously in terms of budget and resources. Some of these are very personal, uh, no-budget movies almost. And then I think someone like Georgie, you're working with a bigger budget, I'm assuming, with some special effects and things like that. Um, I'm wondering, well, one of a couple of you want to talk about raising funds to make these movies while also staying personal. Um, I'm sure the students are probably curious how, one, how some of you here making the smaller films are raising the money, and then also how uh, people who are making, even Giannis, your film is a little more, uh, seems like there's a slightly bigger budget as well. Um, can you talk about how, you, we'll start with Georgie, how you started to raise money for his master's voice? Oh, it's, uh, that is the most hardest part uh, of the filmmaking, I think, to find money. Find the possibilities. You make your own ideas, dreams. And <coughs> at terms, um, this, is, uh, this is my uh, huge problem, too. Um, I think uh, uh, this is my six uh, features in my life. But that is the second one that I could make uh, from budget. So, uh, 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 and, uh, and all of the movie looks like bigger budget than really is. Because, uh, because uh, if you don't have enough money, but you uh, put, the, um, put the work into a long term, this is time, time or money. So it's, uh, uh, we had less uh, money, and that is why we shot this last movie uh, more than uh, four years. So we, we shoot it, we wait it, and we work on it, and uh, the CGI uh, made by three people. But that was uh, more than two years. And, uh, and uh, on, the, on the screen looks like it's a oh, very expensive American uh, Marvel movie. It's, uh, but uh, but uh, I believe uh, much more important to find uh, good and creative people who put the work inside than uh, uh, to spend a lot of money. I would like, of course, but that was. Uh, but the budget was big. It's uh, uh, usually three million euros, and uh, this is came from the government, and. Uh, uh, um, we applied for it, and looks like uh, um, this is uh, very much. But that is uh, 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 that is my last ten years' works to get the, such a money <laughs> like this. And the same times, so I, I, I work uh, work on it uh, uh, a very very low budget movies. It's uh, you know it's uh, 50k or or or, or, or nothing. Um, Giannis, with your film, it's called Foam at the Mouth. Um, can you, I'm curious, one about the story and where maybe you got the idea for this uh, kind of this relationship, marriage breaking down, and uh, kind of integrating that story into this uh, wider story about a kind of a dogs that have been. Uh, uh, I can't think of the name or like the term, but that are like been contaminated or whatever, there's a disease going around, yeah. Um, can you talk about how you develop the story and then how you start to raise money for this semi-strange uh, experiment? Yeah, hi everyone. I just realized we went to the same film school, to NFTS. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Let's talk later. Uh, um, yeah, actually, uh, this, the film, Form of the Mouse, it's actually based on uh, an American script uh, by Matt Gossett, uh, I, I, uh, I read about it in internet, I just and I just like the synopsis. It's di it's, di it's quite a different movie in American version. It's uh, when Amazon started their kind of screen screenwriting grants. Then the first year, then it, I think it got the first prize or something like that. And then uh, two years passed from there on, and uh, and and Amazon lost the rights, and then we bought the the the, the, the initial version of the script. But then it got quite heavily adapted and rewritten for Latvia because uh, obviously there's you know things and you know relationship dynamics and kind of social structures that change once once you when, once you kind of move it from a 
one society to another. But then uh, if, you, if you were talking about how funding and stuff like that, then similarly everywhere in Europe it's, it's mostly um, European Union and government funds and mm -hmm. combination of, of, of those. Uh, so it's basically you look, you know, you have your initial seed funding from your, from your home country, then you look for co-production partners across, and then if you find any, then you might be entitled for European Union funds and so on and so forth. So it's kind of like, um, you know, this kind of chess game of, of trying, you know, trying to put several of these things together. And of course there is, you know, especially in Latvia where we have like two million people, it's very, very hard to talk about industry as such as at all because you you know you you know you can't there is really no market in 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 classical terms you know you can't really release your movie and hope you know that it's gonna make a profit because there's simply not enough people to you know to 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 repay any kind of investment um and what about maybe Af afonso and uh, sophia i know you guys are making smaller personal work, um, presumably with quite a smaller budget. Um, can you talk about raising, like for a 40 minute film, like Seven, seven Years of May, how you're uh, getting the money to do this and then, yeah. <clears throat> Maybe not getting money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this film, it's a uh, story, the financing story, it's a little bit raw because it starts with the phone from my city. It's a very tiny city from Brazilian terms. And uh, there's no culture investment at all. It's a working class and uh, a working class city. And there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of investments, but not, not anything regarding culture at all. But they create a first culture fund, and it's almost a symbolic culture fund that can finance anything, and I send the film to them, and they send me the 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 support, and the support was three thousand dollars, and so I started the film with three thousand dollars, and so when I start to to record, it was insufficient. So I need to take my cash and to make some loans to put on the film. And then I, I finished the first part of the recording, 2017, but I started the editing and I wasn't satisfied. And I realized that I should do a second recording part. And because of the film festival, I was driving around with Araby and I know uh, Argentinian filmmaker that uh, now he's my friend that I really admire his short films that it's Teddy Williams and we were there in Colombia and we are talking about next project See, I told him about this film and he asked me how much money I have when I said three thousand dollars oh man it's <laughs> so little <laughs> and and he offered me to put me in contact with their producing company in Argentina and told me, well, maybe you can do something together. Maybe in Argentina you can do the post-production. Well, if I, if I shouldn't pay the post-production for me, it's a good. It's something that I shouldn't pay. It's, 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 good to, it's good to me. I send the film to them to script the things that I should, that I will have recorded. They like the film. They put it in another known phone from Buenos Aires. And we got the money to make the post-production. But uh, I should make the second part of the recording. I paid by myself as well. And we, we make the second recording in 2018. And then we go into to make the post-production in Argentina. So, and we finished the film in the beginning of this year. And I was with a, this kind of a debt. And hopefully, and thank God, we received an award in Vision du Real. And I gave my money back, and that's the way the <laughs> that's the way the film was financed. It's always the goal. Uh, Sophia, maybe you can talk about uh, funding in Canada. I know that's one of the more contentious topics within independent Canadian cinemas. Who's who's getting the money from certain or organizations? Yeah. Or maybe I just hear about it more because it's in English uh, media news. But 
Mm-hmm. Maybe you can inform people about how that all works and how it uh, like our wrote, granting system. Yeah, yeah, and how it, how it's affected your work. Yeah, so we're really lucky in Canada. We have like three different funding bodies. So there's municipal funding, there's the Toronto Arts Council, there's provincial funding, there's the Ontario Arts Council, and then there's federal funding, the Canada Arts Council. Um, and uh, it's yeah, it's it, it's a privilege to have that kind of opportunity to I guess flesh out a project um, before you make it. Um, and to have the, uh, the chance to apply for that kind of funding because I know that those kinds of systems don't exist um, everywhere. I did a panel uh, like two or three years ago in the US um, and I was talking about applying for grants and how it was such a nuisance and a student put their hand up and they were like, we don't have granting systems here and it was in that moment I was really ashamed of myself actually. Um, but I was like, we're so we're so privileged to have this. But again, within this system, just because you write a grant doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get the money. Like I'm still writing grants um, and sometimes not getting them, but my philosophy, and I think it's really important for all of you to think of this as students, is the more that you write and the more that you put your project out there and the more that you ask, the higher chance and the higher probability um, that one day your film will get that funding. And sometimes like you can get like pretty disheartened when you like pour everything into a project. Like I just wrote a grant recently and I did not get the funding and that was really shitty. But you kind of have to look at it as an opportunity to flesh out your project, to kind of look at those details, um, to think about how you're going to shoot it. And you have to realize that you're not entitled to it either. It's not, it's not owed to you. It's a privilege to have that opportunity to apply for it. Um, and in regards to making, I guess, MS Lovic 7 and like a model of funding that I'm actually trying to get away from was when I had a full-time job, I had the opportunity to apply for a line of credit. So it's like a credit card, but the interest rate is a lot lower. So um, I started making films with lines of credit. So th- the system would be, I would get an idea and I didn't want to wait for the funding because sometimes you can apply for a grant and it can take like a year to get the money and or, or two or three, it can take forever. Like my boyfriend just made a film and it took him six years to get the money. And I was always afraid of the idea that I had and the energy in the moment going stale um, and just kind of like losing the idea for the film. So with MS Lavic 7, I found these letters, I was really excited by them, had them translated. Dara, the co-director of the film, pitched this really interesting structure to me. We had like a week free in the summer and everything just kind of lined up. We got all of our locations for free. I just kind of begged and just tried to kind of like finagle as many resources as I could, shot at my great aunt and uncle's anniversary party um, and tried to be as thrifty as I could, got a lot of things donated in exchange for credits. Um, in the film and and we shot it. We just kind of went with that. And then a model that I've kind of created for myself is I shoot my own films, I edit my own films, I do all of like my Foley and sound design and that's um, I guess like a survival mechanism but also it's a way of kind of like controlling my films and being able to manipulate them and make them exactly as I want. Um, and it's also cheaper because I'm doing all the labor. So what I did for MS Lavic 7 is we spent about $5,000 and we shot for a week. And then I applied for a Canada Council grant and we got $25,000 for post-production. I was able to pay myself back for what we shot because I hired myself back as the editor. So yeah, not a bad plan. Didn't make any money from it. You know, I kind of want to move away from that. I want to start paying myself you know, for, for my work and finding different ways and different models to do that because it's, it's risky, you know, putting something on a line of credit and then hoping to get a grant. But I think that kind of pressure and that kind of stress was what kind of like pushed me to, um, I guess, try to make the film as good as it could possibly be. And I wouldn't necessarily like use that as like a model for yourself. Um, I think it's important to kind of think about how you can use what you have um, to the best of your ability. Um, Jung, we're not, I'm not ignoring you. I'm <laughs> waiting for a certain uh, topic to come up. Your, your film, Winter's Night, which is a really wonderful movie, um, was, it's part of the Jianju Cinema Project, or that's how it originated, correct? So I'm assuming that had different uh, responsibilities and also was 
presumably funded through this project. Uh, can you talk about how that project came about, you were invited to participate, I'm guessing, and then how, how it worked with uh, the money? Um, first of all, my first teacher uh, is found from my graduate school, so this was very easy. And second feature, automaton from deposit of my house in Seoul. So uh, I went to my hometown, Chuncheon. Chuncheon is the Korean title is Chuncheon, Chuncheon. Yeah, there is so nice and warm, cozy place of my parents. <laughs> so they gave me food and <laughs> anything. So uh, the budget is. Second feature about it is uh, twelve thousand dollars US, and we made uh, only three people, include me. Yeah, and camera, recording, directing, me and other. And uh, the other feature film Winter's Night budget is um, one hundred thousand dollars US from Jeonju, Jeonju Film Festival. There is some um, uh, foundation program. Um, they gave, uh, they selected every year three or five fi film, uh, uh, in Korean and international film. So they, um, I, I, I have a script, but it's, uh, only for fun, yeah. And they believe uh, previous my film, so they <laughs> they gave my uh, uh, money for my film, and and then the script uh, go to trash <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, without script, and I shooting with my actor and actress. But uh, future, my first feature film uh, will be very hard to fund. Uh, same in Korea, it's kind of art house film or something. Yeah, and that's all. <laughs> um, your film, as a lot of these people are kind of come from original screenplays, it seems like uh, Georgie though. You're, it's an adaptation of a novel, correct, um, by Stanislav Lem. Uh, can you talk about the uh, adaptation process of your film? And uh, I don't know, if you, I haven't seen other work of yours, but uh, how often you work ad adapting uh, other texts, or if this is the first time experimenting with that? Uh, no, no, not the first time. It, it's, a, uh, it's a very interesting subject for me, how um, um, uh, turn a text uh, to a movie, and I always uh, uh, find uh, uh, the novels. So it's, uh, it's like a source uh, and uh, and the base of uh, idea, because uh, because I think it's uh, uh, the literature is more uh, has has a more freedom and uh, and. Uh, uh, can be more brave than uh, than than the movie, and uh, and uh, that is why I always uh, uh, when I read a good book and say it's wow why I don't see a movie like this if this author is so brave uh, and can write the text it's uh, why I cannot see a movie like this so that is uh, usually uh, uh, that was um, uh, the first idea of my uh, second movie, uh, Taxidermia. I found a very good uh, novel and I adapted and I tried to adapt it and, uh, and, uh, and I wanted to uh, make a movie such a same um, um, feeling inside after I read these novels. And that's happened with uh, Stanislav Lem too. I liked very much how he play with the genres, how he played with uh, different uh, uh, type of text, how he uh, forget usually a story and talk about a problem, but at the same time it's very funny without uh, real narrative, 
This is just a personal diary, but usually nothing happened. Just, uh, um, uh, just a research uh, uh, of the of the very important uh, uh, sci-fi elements of the human um, world. Uh, and this is, a, this is a message. So I tried to translate this book for a movie. I used uh, different kind of cameras, I used different kind of uh, uh, genres, and I tried to be honest uh, with the novels. But in the novels, wasn't story, so we didn't adapt really the novels, we just use it, and usually we decide um, uh, we're making uh, uh, a second part of the book. So we write a new storyline uh, for the book and, uh, and we use the like, uh, ideologically uh, background and, and uh, the uh, main hero father's um, uh, past. So it's, uh, uh, yeah, that was, that was our answer. How, how can we adapt an unadaptable novel? Right. Um, Marius, I have a question about your film, Monster. Um, I'm curious how you came to this. For those who haven't seen the film, it follows kind of a, a married couple in a, in a separate storylines um, over the course of one evening uh, as they both kind of come to terms with their relationship. Uh, by meeting other people. Um, I'm curious how you came to this idea for the film, if it at all uh, has related to you uh, in a personal manner, and then also how you came to this structure where you're kind of following the, the two uh, individuals separately, and then it kind of intersects more toward the end. Yeah, well, um, I was interested in what happens with love after a long period of time, what happens with love in a couple that lasts for longer than, let's say, five, ten years. And also I was interested by partial truth, and that's how I came to the structure of the film, because I think everybody can relate to this. It's like you have friends, for example, and you know, let's say you have a couple as friends, and you hear his story, and you're thinking, yeah, he's actually right, she's a bit of a bitch. And then you, you talk to her, and you're thinking, oh, no, he's a moron, actually, she's right. And you, I think not many people go to the point where they're thinking, okay, maybe there's each one with his or her truth, and how, how do I actually position myself in this uh, mix of partial truth? So I, I, I was curious about this, and I said, okay, let's, let's try and see if this works, if we're portraying 24 hours in the life of this couple, and we're seeing in the first two parts his version, her version, and then in the, sec in the third part, we see them together and we see how the partial truths fit together. Um, and I know you were assistant to Christy Puyu, I think, on his last film. I'm curious where, the, the, I guess, the most visible Romanian cinema for international audiences tend to be the, what people call Romanian New Wave. This, your film is not really operating in that style. I'm cu curious uh, well, what you've learned from working with uh, some of these other filmmakers, but then also how it relates, if at all, to your cinema, and then also how you're just coming to your specific style, which stands outside of, I guess, what is like a typical uh, Romanian uh, style nowadays. Is this an earthquake? <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, um, I was very lucky to have this experience because usually when you're a director you don't get to, if there's one person in the crew that you don't get to work with is another director. Yeah. So, uh, and I mean, probably everybody knows that assistant, uh, assistant to the director or assistant director is a different job. So, uh, actually I worked on a film where I was helping another friend and Anka Puyu, Christy Puyu's producer and wife was the producer on that project and she talked to me one day and she said look Christy is uh, making this new film and he would like to work with uh, someone who's not a professional assistant director mm -hmm. because he's fed up with the assistant director coming to him and saying Christy we're really late we can't shoot this again we need to move on and so on 
So she said he wanted to work with someone who would understand how complicated this is. And uh, I, I met him one day and uh, he's a very intelligent person and also a person who talks a lot and because he's like, yeah, he's taking one thing and twisting it on each possible side. And, and I remember I went there at uh, 5 p.m. and at 4 a.m. I said to him, I'm really sorry, but I think my head is not able to contain this information anymore, so I think we need to stop. But it was like, I mean, I still remember a, a lot of the things that came up in, the, in that conversation. And uh, for me, it was very helpful. I mean, it, it, it literally felt like, uh, how much was it? I think it was almost 10 months that I stayed in that project, and it felt like a third film school that I attended. Yeah, because he's, he's very passionate about what he's doing and he's very honest and he doesn't sacrifice anything when it comes to his vision. I mean, if he wants to say something, the actors can die on the set. He doesn't care. He's gonna say the thing that he wants to say. And, and uh, for me, it was very reassuring actually to see someone that doesn't make compromises when it comes to his vision in this case. So. Um, even when I had hard moments on my own shoot, I was like, well, I'm really sorry if this is complicated for you, but I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna give up and I'm gonna get it the way I want to get it. And uh, also what I really loved about that experience with Pisti was that every morning, so we were starting the shoot at 9 a.m., but we were getting together at 5.30, 6 a.m., and we were having these very long talks about what we were going to shoot that day, and I, I feel I'm really lucky because I didn't just see one Sierra Nevada, I kind of saw all the possible Sierra Nevadas, and I, I, he made me witness his thinking process. So, yeah, I, I, I think, I mean, style-wise and I, Monsters is not at all what Sierra Nevada is. I mean, he, Christie is going for an honesty and a naturalism that I don't believe in fully. But in terms of acting, we are totally on the same page and what he's doing is exactly what I want to do. I mean, I want to see real people on the screen and I, I don't like false notes at, at all in, in, in acting, so, yeah. Um, Jung, you're film also follows a married couple over one evening, uh, very different, in a di very different way. Uh, the stories kind of intersect, and, uh, but they also have to come to terms with their relationship but through these other people and encounters they, they in come across throughout the evening. Um, can you talk about the conceptualization of, your, of the narrative, uh, what you drew on to, for these characters, and uh, just how you went about kind of structuring it in this way where it's kind of cyclical, it uh, begins and ends in a similar way. Uh, just how, how you come to this, is, is it through the writing process or is it something you're, you're seeing as you're filming or is it more maybe editing later? Uh, I thought uh, first structure and then story. Uh, and I s wrote a uh, script, but as I told before, uh, I uh, gave to actor script just one reading, have one reading together, but uh, go through uh, to trust to actor and step or don't bring the script in my field, yeah. And then uh, we talk about her life, his life, and my life, and my friends, so, uh, or my parents. And then we create, recreate character and kind of story. And we decide of uh, history of the character, and we, a lot of uh, facts, uh, kind of facts, history of him, her, and then we, uh, we sh uh, when shoot, uh, I, uh, usually I shoot 
about 30 minutes one scene uh, so uh, there is no envy in my case and we shoot one hour or 40 minutes like documentary fake documentary mm -hmm. and based on we talk about character before shooting and I selected uh, start and end of Purizi and in uh, Winter's Night, in case my uh, Winter's Night, uh, I <coughs> shoot 15 days and uh, finish it one week after shoot because I edited and uh, uh, selected Purizi every day after shooting and we finished it very fast yeah it's about one month or two months yeah and it's my it's very important to me uh the length duration of uh, filming uh, so i asked to to stematographer how long we can take once uh, he told maybe 15 minutes no please make uh, shoot uh, to four four minutes or one hour yeah. I asked to them and they thought why he <laughs> asked about duration something yeah but i uh it's very, it's very important to me and actor because we don't have script we don't have just only character history yeah um Giannis, your film uh like you mentioned before that it came from a script that was already uh written uh and I'm curious how that relates to you once you're on set with the actors. It's a very actor-driven performance piece. Um, would you say, or I'm curious what the relationship's like with the actors and then with you in relation to the script that's already been done since you have, it's not an original script from yourself. Um, is there, are you guys collaborating on and adding to the, to these uh, dramatic elements in the film or is it pretty strict once, once the script is in your hands or how, how does it work with the actors and, and yourself? Yeah, I was very lucky to have uh, the main, the main guy, in the main, act, the, the, the guy who played the main part. He was very. We we talked with him a lot, and we did a lot of rehearsals together in groups <clears throat> before, you know, in, during the pre-production period, like even like one couple of months before the shooting started, and we did a lot of rehearsals and just kind of trying to figure out how things might develop, and a lot of that actually went in the film. Uh, stuff that we found in 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 the rehearsals, and uh, I, I I I brought that in and rewrote scenes, and 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 and, and, and not talking about dialogue, because dialogue is already kind of of course dialogue changes, and you adapt and you adapt and adapt, and it you know it's kind of it's very very fluid, uh, but fluid at, up until the point when you come on the set, once you know. I think Casavides once said, you know, like our, you know, my, you know, my actors improvise, but it doesn't mean that they, when they come on the set, they don't know what they're doing. They know very well they're doing. It's, you know, the work that is done beforehand. You know, it's been filtered out beforehand what works and what not. So, but also after the, after the whole kind of rehearsal process is done, I usually reserve like an hour from the shooting time every day when we just you know, spend time with DP on the set. I just kind of like, I have the actors, we play out the scene, you know, we're just kind of like going through the blocking. Like, even if we have been, you know, to the location scout in kind of like pre-production, all that before, it's always very nice to kind of like get everyone off the set, you know, because it gets very cramped and very loud and, you know, you get like runners around and, you know, every, you know, it's very, very busy. It's very nice always at the at the very beginning of the day, just kind of like to sit down as actors and DP and just kind of like, all right, we're going to go here and here, and the DP just kind of walks in with you, and then 
then you discuss the shots. And then only you bring in the whole crew. They can have the breakfast before there, you know. And then you bring in everyone, and then the mess starts. But it's very kind of, very nice to kind of keep this core quiet, you know. Otherwise, it's it's very, you know, especially with actors, you can you can easily find yourself in a situation when suddenly you serve the production. Somehow, you know, you know, you can. You know, you, you make things easy for production because you have to make it on time and this has to be done in that way. And God forbid you end up in a situation when, you know, like, you know, when it becomes all about focus marks and all, you know, all this nonsense, you know, like, but it's so it's so, yeah, re rehearsals, I believe, is kind of it's it's a very nice privilege if you can have them. I think it's it's a, it's a really, um, you know, a golden minefield. You know, you, you can you can find a lot of good stuff there. Um, we can begin to open it up if anyone has questions for specific filmmakers or about a specific film that you've heard about. Um, does anyone have any questions, comments, anything? You can ask us anything. <laughs> it doesn't even have to be about the films, yeah. Uh, answer. There's one right there. My question is about the uh, film Monster, and what I would like to ask is how, how do you find a topic to talk about, in this case, this couple that is coming to terms? And because for, for me as a student, it's very uh, hard to stay faithful to what I care about, you No, know? because there are so mesmerizing themes or, or topics that could seem to overwhelm people, you know, uh, a lot of social events uh, in this context. So I would like, how, how do you find this truth in, in pursuing this topic and this situation that, that your film uh, portrays? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so I, I did these interviews with married couples, long time married couples, because I wanted to hear what their version of the story was. And I did the interviews one to one, so I didn't see them as a couple. I saw the wife, then I saw the husband. And um, a lot of information came from there, and actually, the stories that I heard informed the story of the film. Like, I, I imagine you've seen the film. Or no, okay. That I shouldn't imagine you've seen the film. Uh, <laughs> um, well, there is a story there at one point. So when there is this encounter between two men, one of the men tells a story, and the story is one to one, a story that I heard in one of these interviews uh, about a guy who was married and had kids, and uh, he was working in Dublin. He was working in Ireland, not in in Romania. So he had his family, his wife and his children in Romania, and he had a work colleague and in the same time a lover in Dublin. And he, he kept this situation going for four years, so he was basically living a double life. And um, yeah, so I, I think, I mean, on one hand you can say that, yeah, I got mesmerized too by in deciding to introduce this story and other ideas from the interviews in the film. But in the same time, I thought that it just made my starting idea that of portraying what love, ha how love changes in a long-time relationship. I think it it just made the story richer, and I think I think you shouldn't be afraid of um, changing in a way your reality and transforming your reality with the information that you're getting from the outside. I think. You know, I, I kept on saying this to the actors and to the people that I was working with on this film. I said, if I'm leaving the set in, at the end of the day as stupid as I got there in the morning, then it was a wasted day. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not interested in that. If the reality leaves me exactly how I started, then either I'm stupid or reality is not, <laughs> you know, I, I, it's, it's not what it should be. So yeah, I, I think it's you. One shouldn't be afraid of taking in what 
reality is is giving and yeah you need you need to keep your focus but uh yeah no i i, I think as as long as you know why you're staying why you're telling a certain story then it's you you shouldn't be afraid of reality i feel like i said the same thing like five times yeah okay right there So my question is for Sofia. Uh, I was wondering, uh, so you find these layers, and I, I presume, I don't know this, but I presume that you have like a fascination with uh, written word. And it's very interesting to me, how do you take on something that can, can be seen as like a very uncinematic, if that's even a word thing, and that you can take it on, on a film and put it on film and, and you know, uh, film, literally just words, uh, you have a beautiful rack focus, it's like a very pre uh, precise focus that I'm, uh, as an audience, I'm trying to read what's on the page, but I'm unable to read uh, except like the first word of each uh, line of, of the page, and it was very interesting to me, how do you decide that uh, film is a medium in which you can take on this very uh, still, very rigid structures that uh, are, you know, the, the letters that you use for your film? That's a great question. Um, thank you for that. Yeah, you know, I have, um, I think in all of my films, I have like a fascination um, with the archive, um, like physical archives, but also the archive of the mind, how we remember things and how that impacts us here and now. And in terms of working with those letters, um, it was really exciting for me to discover these letters um, that depicted my great-grandmother. So she was living in Toronto after surviving World War II. Um, and she was writing to a Holocaust survivor who was living in New York City in the Bronx. Um, and uh, they were both poets, and they connected on that level, and they had a correspondence of 25 letters. And that's what the focus of MS Slavic 7 is. And in thinking about um, making this film, we were thinking about how we could bring these letters to life, aside from reading them. And in a lot of the conversations that Dara and I had in conceptualizing the film, there were three elements that we were really interested in. And the first one was like the letters themselves as objects, which is spoken a lot about in the film. So like the physical object, what does the paper look like? How does it feel? Um, how can we simulate or bring the audience closer to how these letters might feel in her hands? The second one was, you know, like the spirit of the, the letter. Benjamin talks a lot about in some of his theories in writing about, you know, with the progress of like technology, um, people like to kind of like go back to the tactile things that you can hold um, in your hands. And I believe that, you know, every object um, has kind of like an aura and holds like the weight and history of its owner. Um, and that was one thing I really wanted to explore were these, I guess, these letters um, as these markers of existence between my great grandmother and this man that she was writing to um, and corresponding with. So that was another element that we wanted to incorporate into the film and we tried to do that um, in the scene where she's looking at the letters with an overhead projector um, and examining them that way. And then the third part is the content of the letters. So what were the words that they were actually saying to one another? What were they sharing? And the character, Audrey, she doesn't speak Polish. I don't speak Polish either, but what we were trying to, I, I guess, like explore and communicate, um, I think, with those letters is to try to kind of um, explore the idea that even though, like, I can't fully understand what my great-grandmother experienced, what she went through, how she survived the war, and I also don't speak the Polish language either, but does the weight of that history still exist here and now? How does that impact me? And can you, I guess, like, feel that history through the engagement of those objects. So those were things that we really carefully thought about in like developing the structure of the film and those were things that actually Dara teased out when she pitched the structure and then as we started to film it, it kind of took on a life of its own. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Are you there? Uh, how do you manage to uh, fight uh, creative blocking 
in terms of uh, pre-production, when you're in pre-production, you're like working in, in, the, in the film and you have your table like full of papers like you're a lawyer. And then in, in production, there's like a lot of stress. Maybe uh, your actor it can arrive early and you have uh, problems in terms of light. And then in post-production, you have like a lot of material you have to edit and qualify and a lot of stuff. And in this three pro uh, process, you have to be like super creative in order to have a, a great film. How do you manage to, to fight this creative blocking between stress and anxiety and, and this. Thank you. This creative what? Uh, blocking. Like when uh, actors, uh -huh. uh, actors and, and like uh, when you're, when you have to be, when you're in a creative process, when, when you have stress, you can. Like an impasse. Like you, you mean, I think he means uh, like if you're creatively blocked when you, how, how you guys deal with how you guys deal with being creatively blocked during the process of pre-production and through through the course of filming? Did anyone have particularly difficult time seeing the film to uh, fruition? <laughs> Georgie, I feel like your film it has so many different elements, and it maybe uh, 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 need to find out some method. How can you uh, uh, be on the set, and how can you um, uh, uh, ver work with it? Because it's uh, not necessary always to be smart, and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and and sometimes happened nothing in your hand, <laughs> and then the block is coming, and uh, 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 that time for me, it's uh, usually I continue a work. I hope nobody <laughs> realized <laughs> what happening, what happening inside. So I, I, I continue and try to do what I know, because a lot of people there. So it's, uh, it's, it's uh, you can, you can, you can continue a work. The stress is big, because uh, because you have very short time to do what you prepare. Three years, four years, five years, maybe your whole life. Uh, prepare for this moment to do something, and this is, this is I know this is a huge stress, but uh, uh, um, but I, I don't know how to say it. You can do it, so it's uh, it's uh, will be something in the end. It's uh, I don't know why I need to answer first, <laughs> but um, uh, but my 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 last movie, my last movie, what is uh, what is here, the, his master voice. That was full of this, uh, this chaos, the shooting. It, uh, that was a very, very bad crew, a service crew from other country, uh, not uh, where I'm living. It's a different language, and they doesn't want to uh, work because it's, uh, they, became, they believe they are professional without passion without uh, uh, something to do a film, and that was a shocking situation for me. I always uh, shoot a film with people who likes to make movies, who likes to record sound, who they, they like to uh, make a camera movement, or, or, or they like to put the lamp, something. And I got a professional uh, crew, and that was uh, totally shocked, and my mind uh, blocked because I always uh, needed to tell. We arrive six o'clock in the morning, and now it's nine o'clock. Where is my camera? Where is my pictures? Where is my monitor? <laughs> you know, it's very hard to tell for the actor after something very intimate thing. Uh, after you laugh, uh, after you shout uh, three three hours before. And uh, and and uh, unfortunately, you can you can see on the movie. So I try to save the movie. I try to uh, cover uh, the ideas, but uh, in the in the editing room, in a silent, I I uh, realized all of the problem into the movie. So it's, uh, but, uh, but the, the movie is ready, some people like it, and uh, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs>
Can I oh, add something? Yeah. I think it's really important, taking on what you said, it's really important to pick wisely the people you're working with because, um, yeah, it can be just horrible to be on the set and to realize that people are worrying about the dessert and the fact that the food is not going to be served in time or, you know, it's like it's cold here and there's a sort of a draft, so can we move a bit faster through this scene and so on. And, but this is like joke, joke aside, it's, it's really important to have people that you trust and people you're working well with because there are moments when you can block and I think at those moments, and this is something I learned actually from Christy Puyo, is sometimes it's just wise to say, I don't know. I don't know how to do this, let's discover this together, I just don't know it. Because I remember another Romanian director told me this story about this creative block and <laughs> he did something a bit unorthodox because he couldn't work with the actors anymore, he wasn't getting what he wanted to do. And he actually gave like 10 euros to one of the guys who was working on the lights and said, just go and break that bulb. So like this, we can say we can't film today anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they did that and oh, whoops, we can't film it today. So we'll, we'll stop and we'll come back tomorrow. So I, I, I think you, if you trust the people that you're working with and if you have a good collaboration with them, you can just say when it happens, look, I'm stuck now. I don't know how to do this because I think it's worse to do it just for the sake of doing it and saying, well, it can't get better, let's just do it like that. Let's do it like that and go through it. Because usually when, if you're doing that, it's gonna get cut out of the film, so it's not worth the effort. Any other questions? We'll go with her. Um. Uh, my, my question is for uh, Wujin. Uh, <laughs> um, I would like to know if this is your first time one of your movies is uh, presented in Latin America or Mexico. And I would like to know if, you, if it's hard for you to create like a universal language in, in your uh, filmmaking because I don't know for us it's Sometimes it's hard to get the access of Asian cinema or South Korean films. So, um, yeah, maybe, uh, well, I know people that cannot connect with that kind of films because of the cultural differences. So, uh, yeah, I would like to know if, if it's hard for you to create a universal language to connect with the rest of, of the world or, or Mexico or Latin America or is something that um, I don't know that you just uh, do the movie and you just hope that it connects with certain parts of the world or only with people of South Korea. So, yeah. <laughs> it's a very uh, difficult question, uh, but mm, I think uh, uh, most Korean, uh, most uh, close to Korean culture is uh, most global, I think. So I focused only Korean unique, some uh, unique things in Korean, and then uh, I spend a lot of time with translator. Yeah, and then language. Uh, <laughs> um, but cinema is uh, has image and sound, you know, and actor emotions. So I believe uh, some it can be connect uh, without language. So I prefer uh, image and sound than dialogues. But dialogue is important to also, but I prefer image and sound, uh, storytelling, visual telling, and, and I hope uh, global language, I, I hope made uh, several languages, English or Spanish, something, but uh, now I, <laughs> I can speak English not well, but, so I hope future, uh, 
uh, make Korean English language film. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You still have one? Yeah. I know that uh, on the screening you were telling us that you had the story from her beforehand. You made a short film, something like that. But I was wondering if you ever consider uh, mixing the structure around. Uh, let's say you can have the story of him first, and then she is like the background uh, for him, or maybe you can have them two together and then the individual parts. And I was just wondering if you thought this was the most effective uh, structure to to do it, or if it was just uh, what you envisioned from the beginning and you just uh, didn't consider any other possibility? Thank you very much. Yeah, again, a very good question. And we thought about this quite a lot. I mean, this was the, the initial structure and the structure I had in the script. But there were moments when uh, we thought, what if we would twist this around? And we even thought at one point, what if we make them, we make a structure in par parallel? We see a bit of her, a bit of his story, and so on, and move back and forth in between the two stories. Also, it didn't help the fact that when we started having the pre-screenings, when we started showing the film, a lot of people were finding the second part more interesting than the first part. And they were saying that the film starts a bit too slow. So the thing is that, uh, to me, even though it's, it might be less appealing, let's say, for the audience, this structure helps with the whole idea I wanted to convey with the film is that it's very easy to judge and to label people without understanding what's happening to them. And if I would have put the stories in the opposite, I mean, not the opposite, if I would have started with his story, her problem would have been clear right away. And I think people would have turned her instantly into a victim. So, I, and I wasn't interested by that. I mean, even now, yesterday, some people told me like, yeah, but she's so sad in the film. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, just imagine that with, uh, in, the, in the situation in which the structure would have been his story and her story and then their story together, probably everybody would have looked at her at the poor woman, that's why she's so sad because he's cheating on her and so on and so on. So uh, I, I think probably I thought that the gains are the biggest with this kind of structure, but he, yeah, I mean, it would have been interesting. We even thought at one point, you know, if, if this would have been shot on film and it would have been shown there were different roles of film, if somebody would have like mixed the roles and started with his part and then show her part, what would the effect would have been? I don't know, maybe in the future we can try and have a special screening and like mix <laughs> things around. And yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I told you why I, why I chose this. And also, maybe it had something to do a little bit, now I realize with inertia, the fact that her part was the one that I've done as a short film in 2015, and that was, to me, it felt like the story that I already knew and I already told, and I don't know, maybe it, it felt natural to be the first part in the, in the big film. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, okay. Um, oh, go ahead, yeah. I must go. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> We're done, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm bored. <laughs> Is is anyone anyone have any other last questions? Yeah. We're getting toward the end here, but yeah, go ahead. Uh, so I was also wondering, uh, Mary, is that uh, you seem to have like a very specific way of working with actors, and I was wondering if you could uh, maybe just uh, show us through a little bit of your process uh, with Monstry. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, tell us, or describe us, um, how do you prepare actors for a role? Well, I, well I, I think there's no recipe with that, and if I can tell you, it's like with him, I worked for one year, so with the main actor, and we rehearsed and rehearsed, and he didn't even know at one point if he was still in the film or not, because we were like changing so many things and tried, I mean, I rewrote the, the script quite a lot for his bit. 
And with her, she entered, so the main actress entered in the film two days before we actually started shooting. Because I, I decided two days before the shoot that I, oh, I'm not happy with the actress who, were, who was playing the, the part. So I, I just made my entire crew and especially the producer go completely crazy. And I said, well, I, this is not working. I'm not going to do this film with her. I'm going to choose this. You did. So the, the main actress had just one tiny part in the film. She was appearing in just one scene. And uh, when we rehearsed, there was something about her that just caught my eye all the time. And I couldn't focus on the other uh, actors because there was something, there was this sadness and this, how should I say, she seemed preoccupied by something all the time. That it seemed like something was in her mind all the time. So. So what, what I want to say with this is that with some actors you need to work a lot and you need to find the character through, oh, I don't know, like trying things, testing things, rewriting, bringing sometimes, I, I feel that with uh, the main actor I kind of brought the character towards him also, not just him towards the character. And with some actors, like it's the case with you, that you just have the, I mean I felt that she was my character and even I'm I think for him it was much tougher than for her because with him I was doing like 30 takes 40 takes and I was getting angry and I was saying this is not right you didn't get anything from what this character is supposed to be and well and with her I was doing two takes and I was like this is it I don't want to change anything so I, I, I again I think you need to adapt to to reality, with some actors you need to work a lot. I mean, if you if you think they're right for the part, and with some actors it can, it can, you know, she was like doing tiny gestures, or she was looking or saying, "I don't feel like doing this now. I feel like just taking some more time and afterwards going, let's say, to the window." And and I was like, I was saying, "Yeah, try it and let's see it," and it felt natural. So uh, I think that. Putting these two together, if you if you make them, if you manage to make the actors understand what you want to get and who the characters are, then I think you should allow yourself or allow them more to 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 go their own way to that. Oh, this doesn't sound like English. It's <laughs> you should allow them to to find that character in their own way and. You know, it's even if it's not a hundred percent what you imagine in the beginning. I mean, with this film, I think except two actors, none of the actors is is my initial choice. Some of them, as I said in the Q and A, died. Some of them couldn't do the part. Some of them, I don't know. With some of them, I started really big fights. So I, I anyways, but more on that. <laughs> Um, I think we've come to our time uh, limit here. But uh, th the filmmakers will be around to chat if you want to talk to them personally. Uh, but you should go see their films as well. Uh, but join me in thanking our, our guests. <laughs>